I think it's on me to start. Welcome everybody to this Beyond Standards in Carbon Markets webinar, uh, co-hosted by the C, C Media and Space Intelligence. We have a very interesting panel today of practitioners that will tell us about what they think is beyond, you know, beyond standards in the voluntary carbon market. Um, and to set the scene, I'd like to invite Murray Collins, CEO and co-founder of Space Intelligence, to give us a, an overview from your perspective and not only what it is, but also how, what are the challenges and what an organization like Space Intelligence can do. Um, over to you, Murray. Brilliant. Well, thank you very, very much. I'm um, a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to share a, a few slides just to um, to, to shape uh, what I what I talk about. But just briefly to introduce myself, um, I'm Murray Collins. I'm the uh, the CEO and the co-founder of Space Intelligence. We're a nature tech company based here in the UK. A uh, team of um, 50 plus people, all analysing um, satellite data. In order, fundamentally, our mission is to support a world with uh, zero deforestation and mass restoration. And really, um, I'd love to just say a few words about how we believe that remote sensing data can provide confidence in nature impact and, and go beyond the standards. Um, a little bit on my own background. Um, I've spent the past part of the past uh, 20 years working in uh, rainforest environments around the world. And the picture in the top left corner is my home for seven months in Gabon when I measured uh, some four and a half thousand trees for the uh, for the government of Gabon in the first biomass assessment for the country. A view of uh, of the interior of uh, Sierra Leone there and, uh, and of course an orangutan in um, a country which I know very well, Indonesia. Um, and so something, uh, this is something which is very, very close to my own heart, the, the quality of forest conservation and restoration projects around the world and is really my own motivation for, for co-founding the business. The way I see the market at the moment and something which I'm sure is very familiar to, to everybody who is tuning into this uh, presentation is that over the past year in, in particular, there's been a fairly central challenge of um, uh, wanting to support nature on the one hand, but there being somewhat of a, of a doom loop. So some questions about uh, trust and integrity leading to reduced investment um, and lower project viability as a result. Uh, people are often telling us that they're really challenged on the buy side um, to find high quality projects. So there's quite a few high quality projects, which means that then in turn, uh, companies don't have the, uh, the confidence to invest. We end up with missed targets and we're not fundamentally addressing the challenge, which we all need to. So um, reducing deforestation, hitting net zero and addressing the parallel biodiversity crisis. So I think fair to say that we need to have a carbon market 2.0. Uh, and that needs to be scaled to be able to achieve these objectives. Developers, so people on the supply side, really need to be able to create and showcase the impact uh, of their work. And that's going to improve, improve the, the quality of supply of, of credits in the market. Uh, and on the other hand, on the, on the buy side, buyers need confidence on the impacts of projects to increase their investment. Obviously, this is a carbon market. We're, we're primarily concerned with the impact uh, in terms of uh, the, the carbon uh, profile of a, of a project, but really certainly to me uh, and to, to many others, if you think about some of the standards which now exist, it's also about that triple bottom line. It's about providing impacts for local communities and ensuring sustainable local economic development for the some 1.6 billion of the world's poorest people who are forest dependent, and then also uh, addressing the parallel biodiversity crisis. So I think the highest quality projects which does indeed um, uh, take us away from the existing standards, means uh, delivering on each of those metrics. Integrity, we really think about that in terms of providing transparency and impact on the work that is being done on both the uh, uh, supply and the demand side. Our own company, Space Intelligence, as I say, we're, we're specialists in remote sensing analytics. We believe that high quality analytics can really help you provide confidence to yourself and to stakeholders to enable you to go beyond the standards. 
So standards, really the rules of the game, which are uh, set out to enable us all to, to generate and transact in uh, nature-based credits. Uh, the key point we believe is the inf increased in integrity. So quality information will help surpass those. The key point is that not all remote sensing analytics uh, is created equally. Uh, and so when you're out in this market, Obviously, we would love space intelligence to support the project developers and, uh, and corporate buyers who are watching uh, this stream. But whoever you end up working with, I think it's uh, useful to point out what the key considerations are when uh, deciding what data sets to use and who to work with. Data sets produced with an integrated expertise in ecology, AI, uh, and remote sensing is really critical because those are the, the pieces of the, uh, the pie, the recipe that you need to create high quality data and insights. Data should be locally calibrated. So uh, whilst it's appealing to create global models, in order to be able to create very, very high quality insights and high quality projects, you need local calibration and validation. So independent accuracy assessments we see is really vital to bring the highest quality projects to market. If you're assessing carbon stocks, really there should be an integration of the use of LIDAR. So a remote sensing technology which uses pulses of laser light to inform you about the structure and particularly the height uh, of tropical forests, which is a key component in understanding biomass assessment. A really important component uh, to understand is if a provider can uh, talk in a meaningful way about uncertainties of any assessment, because obviously if you have an assessment of the amount of biomass and the carbon stored within a project and the associated impacts of that project, it's not just a, a single number, it's an, it's an estimate. Science works with estimates and deals with uncertainties. So it's crucial to have those uncertainties quantified and articulated. And critically, any data set which you consume should be able to be produced consistently both over space and over time, which ensures comparability. How do we do that? There shouldn't be too many surprises here. This integration of satellite remote sensing data using the machine learning framework with uh, with information from the field and ecological expertise. So uh, bringing together information about the type of environment that you're mapping with satellites of various types looking down on the project area and all analyzed by this massive uh, availability of machine learning and AI technologies. The data sets that we produce and focus on are the carbon stock estimates and land cover, which in turn allows us to produce changes over time. And they're validated, those uh, maps that we produce and those data sets which we license. We provide accuracy assessments and uncertainty assessments for both of those uh, products. And these result at the end of the process in, uh, in insights. So if you're on a, in the buy side, uh, project screening, um, if you're on the supply side, it supports project origination um, and allows uh, an independent third party to, uh, to assess the impact of a given project. Why us? Well, space intelligence, we frame ourselves uh, as, as leading experts in this domain, trusted by various data providers with a range of very high quality partners and clients. We've got well over 100 scientific papers in this domain uh, from our science uh, team. Uh, we've got 12 PhDs uh, within our team driving that science and engineering forwards. And critically, we've got that experience at the intersection of ecology, remote sensing, physics and engineering, which allows us to produce the high quality data sets. So uh, on that note, thanks once again to, um, to, to Warren and the team uh, for inviting us to, to co-host this event. Um, hopefully that's some, a bit of useful background uh, for, the, for the rest of the panel. Uh, I wish you a very, very successful and productive conversation. Uh, and our Space Intelligence team looks forward to seeing you at CIFB in person in Chicago. Thank you, Murray. Thank you very much. And uh, this is, you know, thank you for setting the scene about, you know, already kind of hinting on what do we mean by going beyond standard and the fact that when we are talking about voluntary carbon market for nature, we are talking about something special. It's not just the one ton of carbon, right? Um, and just to say, you know, in my job as a director of the Natural Climate Solution Alliance, effectively, we see the voluntary carbon market as a mean to an end, not the end itself. It's really about how do we finance nature conservation, which, you know, the protection and improved management and restoration of nature. And therefore, 
it's yes, of course, what is traded is the one ton of carbon, but we definitely need more because what we want is to make sure that we get a proper uplift of biodiversity and real contribution to people. But I'm not here, I'm not the one of the, the speakers, I'm here to actually ask questions to our panelists today, to actually, you know, have a chance to share their views about this idea of going beyond standards, about, you know, already, well, important is that we have standards, but why in nature is important to also think beyond that. Um, so we have... For panelists, uh, I think the idea is that we, I will ask them questions and the introduction would be made in directly into the chat. So we are, we are not going to read their amazing bios, but they have amazing bios. Um, and then differently from what Warren suggested, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A function, because at the end we have, if everything goes according to plan, we are going to have around 10 minutes. And so we can pick some of the questions and ask our speakers about that. So to follow on what Murray was presenting, I will ask first Joe, who is the founder and uh, director of finance for Carbon Tanzania, a project developer, to tell us what do you exactly mean for, from, you, from your perspective? What does qualify to go above and beyond standard? Uh, we can hear you, Joe. Sorry. Thanks, Julia. Thank you. Um, and thank you to Space Intelligence and uh, Ian for having us on, on the webinar. Um, so, yeah, from the point of view of a project developer, for us, it's, um, it's clear from, uh, from what Murray highlighted there that unfortunately while standards are available to us all and um, you know imperfect as some of them are we do need to standardize the um, the quantification of what we're achieving in our conservation efforts um, we all know that uh, especially in the current um, climate we need to do things which demonstrate that the the product that we're producing the the emission reductions that we're creating um, really are providing some of the you know the, the great benefits that we all want them to for for, for, for society um, beyond you know beyond this one ton of carbon that we're focused on and um, you know for us it, it does mean that we you know we're committed and, and Carbon Tanzania was, was, was formed uh, specifically to address the issue of local communities not being able to be compensated um, at all, really, for any efforts they make to manage or, or, or protect um, natural habitats. You know, and for us, it's forests here in Tanzania. So, you know, for us, it's, it's making sure that we, um, we, we, we obviously meet the standards that we choose for our projects, but then... Um, we go far beyond that in both measuring biodiversity and doing monitoring uh, and reporting um, processes that, that 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 help us to, to you know to tell the world to tell the, the customers and the and the corporate world um, what what extra biodiversity values are probably in that landscape. Um, so you know we we, we always try and um, using the appropriate uh, metrics. Um, do a lot more monitoring of either, you know, the birds or the mammals or, or the other types of wildlife that are existing in the in the forest that we're um, obviously subjecting to the carbon project. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're monitoring chimpanzees in one of our landscapes. We're doing deep dives into mammal occupancy in others, um, and all of this goes far beyond getting just a certification from CCB or or, or, or another standard. Um, and then, of course, the social side of it, we've actually developed um, uh, a social value tool that we're now using in our projects to, to really find out what the lived experience of our communities are in, in, in receiving the revenues from carbon projects. So that beyond just saying, for example, well, we've ticked the box that 100 children were sent to school, we've actually gone much further and tried to understand what has changed for the people in, in our communities uh, and what has happened as a result of, uh, as I say, putting in place the carbon project and then benefiting from the receipt of revenues. So I think it's, it's, it's all about, you know, looking for ways to better understand what is happening as a result of the core activity, which is in a carbon project, trying to, to demonstrate carbon values. Yeah, so basically the carbon is the enabling factor for all the other activities, right, and for the other outcomes. Um, 
is the majority of our clients asking you about the other outcomes the you know the all the biodiversity and the social outcomes are they curious do they know do they want to know yeah i would say you know that part of why we've done this is it, it, it's a double thing partly it's the mission and we would like to stand by the fact that we you know we, we're committed to doing it in any case but the reality is also we've been pushed by clients to, to provide much more richness in the in the data, both on biodiversity and social outcomes. Um, and therefore, we've had to think about how we better implement monitoring and evaluation and learning in the project cycles that, we, that we're running. So it, it, it's a two-way thing. There's no doubt about it. Uh, you know, we're, the, we're feeling it from the clients. Um, and, and the only challenge being that all the different, many of the different clients and the customers out there want the data in different forms, which is the, the biggest challenge yeah. we have. But we yeah, can talk about thank that. you. Yeah, and so I would like to ask Gareth, other project developer, from, from your perspective and, you know, your own stories, what what do you, what exactly do you do in terms of what does it qualify to go, you know, from of going above and beyond the carbon standards? Okay, thank you, Julia, and uh, thanks to for the opportunity to be here with you today. Um, hello to everybody listening. Um, as Julia mentioned, we're running a project in Peru. We have 183,000 hectares in a project uh, which is a an avoided logging uh, VM10 project. We think we're quite unusual. Uh, there are not too many VM10 projects around. Uh, it is we're different in the sense that we were a logging company, so we've moved transitioned from one model to another model and we did this around about 2020 um, so quite a dramatic change for us um, and it has been a very uh, exciting and challenging process but hugely rewarding um, with regards to the, the the quality of the project everybody's talking about quality we all want quality and I'm sure all of the developers here believe that they have the highest quality project around, uh, or if not, uh, very close to, and that, that's everybody's challenge. And I, I think it's very important to stress that if a project developer isn't committed uh, really into wanting to do it something cooperatively, it, it, it's not going to happen. It has to come from the heart as much as the, as the business uh, side of the, of the equation. Um, Within the, the project, of course, we need the uh, we all need to prove that we've got a positive carbon effect, uh, and certainly um, uh, the technology that companies like Space Intelligence bring, and we use Space Intelligence, uh, and we're very happy with the the results that we've had in providing accuracy to the carbon volumes. And this is obviously the first uh, and uh, key point to having a, a quality project. Uh, clients can trust the, the, the volumes that we've got um, and we can move forward on a, on a very solid basis thanks to that technology. Following on from that, of course, we've got the communities and we've got the biodiversity. Uh, we believe absolutely that our community partners or um, neighbors, in fact, because they're not living inside our concessions, but they live very close to. But we, we see the communities as our partners in this process. We couldn't do it without them. We share the same challenges. We share the same risks. So we have to work together in order to, 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 to cohabit the same, the same area. Um, huge amount of work about more than 40% of our operating budget goes in, in community relations, um, vast areas to cover, lots of people and communities, all with different ideas, thoughts, needs, desires. Um, but it's starting off at fundamental grassroots uh, uh, work like making sure that the communities have got land title, have got their or their communities uh, correctly registered with the authorities so that they can then move on and do their own things as we implement um, uh, opportunities for them and with them, of course. Um, so, and then that develops through into into uh, life studies in the communities and move it with where CCB uh, accredited. So that's a, a whole challenge as well. But 
we very much see that we've got to go f much further than that. And, and with, for example, we've committed ourselves to nine SDGs and we have this year signed uh, an agreement with Oxford uh, SDG Lab to help us monitor and uh, evaluate the impact specifically on the, the economic and the, the good jobs aspect, the S, uh, SDG 8. Um, and we expect to implement and to analyze the other uh, uh, goals uh, as we move forward. But we think this is a really important uh, way of demonstrating to potential clients and to the world that we, we really are having an effect uh, ec economically within the communities. So this is uh, hugely important to us. Um, and then I think similar to what Joe said with regards to biodiversity, it's, it's moving beyond, it's, it's uh, complying with what we have to do, but looking at what else we can do. As, and we see that uh, forming alliances with institutions, with universities, with uh, different NGOs who can help us monitor what's going on inside our, our, our forest uh, is hugely important. And, and we're doing similar work uh, with, um, with uh, 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 tigers and with otter, otter, river otters, etc. So just pushing forward and making sure that you're one step ahead and doing as much as possible uh, to, to develop new ideas and new thoughts. Thank you, Gareth. So this actually brings me nicely to Josh um, from Everland, CEO of Everland. You see a, a number of different projects, right, in your in your. Uh, role of you know marketing and bringing this you know these uh, solutions to market what do you think i mean how Im important is this um race to the top right and uh how are the you know is is it just is it about competition or about a common sense of you know delivering something for bigger than the individual projects hi julia it's good to see you Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, well, sure, it's a competition, but what's the competition about? It's and what is it against? It's against the systems and the incentives and the pressures that lead to the destruction of nature. That's what we're competing against. So, you know, what what Joe and Gareth are talking about are different different fields where that competition is playing out. But there's something common to this field of battle, right? What is just what is leading to the destruction of nature? It's economics. It's pressures that are driven by economics. So it's all about how you transform the economic drivers of forest loss, nature loss, into something that looks like durable incentives and structures for nature conservation, which means ultimately ensuring that um, the choice of conservation for those people, those stakeholders that have a say in the fate of the forest are better than the alternatives. And so really what, what's the race to the top? What's the competition about? It's how quickly and how effectively different configurations of partners, project developers and partnership with communities and partnerships with governments can come together and work in real places with real histories, real institutions, real people with all of their flaws and complications and, and somehow work together to motivate and sustain durable behavior change. Th that in a nutshell is what the theory of change is of all of these projects. It's, it's, it's common to all of them. And, and for us, good projects do a great job of working together in partnership with the forest stakeholders to deliver value for the for their choice collectively to choose conservation. And by the way, you can't get a carbon credit, at least not over the long term, without doing that, because these these core benefits are upstream of you get the emissions reductions because people make a choice to support conservation instead of destroying the forest. And so I, I think the way that we think about this stuff with like co-benefits is something tagged along as an extra or something. It doesn't make any sense to us because central and fundamental to this whole thing is the de delivery of this value. And so, yeah, you know, that's all the stuff that might be considered beyond standards right now. But I, I actually think that that's a problem 
So we've, you know, we've like hung our hat at Everland on marketing, partnering with and marketing projects that are exceptional in this regard. But the problem is that um, the way the market is today, that's not tenable because people have lost, as, as everybody's been talking about, and Murray, you know, brought it forward really nicely at the beginning, we've lost trust. And so, you know, I, I think the idea that somehow this kind of the recognition and these approaches can somehow live past and, and exist to the side of the standards anymore is probably not going to be tenable over the long term because buyers need to be safe to act. And to do that, they have to have trust in th that this information is good and it can't just it's not going to work if it's bespoke and and Gareth and Joe and their teams do a great job, but other people don't. Um, so, yeah, yeah. so I, th I think to the degree that the, those organizations sh should be competing, it's only on the basis of the kinds of deals they can offer to the communities and the governments. That's where the competition should be so that, you know, service providers are competing to offer great alternatives, great options, um, you know, for the constituents on the ground that we're all here in service to. Yeah, no, thank you, Josh. And I think this point about, you know, the biodiversity gains and social contributions and social benefits are not co-benefits, but because are the, you know, they actually underpin the successful solution is something that, you know, when I joined the NCSA, I we edited all the documents to remove the co-benefits and make them as core benefit, like they're really actually the pillar upon which the project is built, right? Without them is... I would say maybe the carbon is the co-benefit <laughs> rather than the other way around. But possibly it's also because, you know, the issue of going beyond your right, it's, um, it's strange, right, that we talk about this when the project is about conservation. It is about, you know, development and for people. Um, but I think that the question is that there is a, the standards are somehow, uh, you know, they're focusing on what is traded and maybe it's our role to raise the awareness of making sure that for projects that focus on nature, there has to be some also recognition that these elements must be in, otherwise is is not really an NCS. Now, Alexis, also you are from um, Space Intelligence. I think the the questions that you know this all additional efforts bring to the table the challenge about how do we measure these right and how can we well tell the story is such an important element because if these additional efforts go because we're going to also talk about pricing later but they you know we can't talk about them how can we put a value on them and how we can reward them right so what is the role of new the new technologies and what is the current opportunity for the new technologies to be able to measure these uh, you know these benefits and these um, changes possibly in a cost effective way yeah, great. Thanks, everyone. Lovely, lovely to be here. Uh, and thanks to my fellow panelists uh, as well. Um, I think one of the things that that Murray mentioned uh, at the beginning, again, is that that lack of trust uh, at the moment. And I think that a digital MRV is something that can bring that back or help bring that back to the market in terms of more frequent monitoring of projects. So instead of checking in, say, once every two years, uh, every three years, we should be looking at each of these project sites on an annual basis at least, uh, more frequently if possible, which allows people, both project developers, investors, stakeholders, anybody interested um, in each project to keep an eye on things more frequently, uh, assess for red flags, for example, deforestation, uh, forest degradation, storm damage, anything that might lower the value of the product uh, project or put that, that at risk can be monitored much more frequently to allow for a quicker response. So we're not losing um, components of the project over time. Um, but also the, the storytelling component you're mentioning as well. Uh, MRV has a really important role to play in that, um, particularly satellite data as well, um, which is something we're working on here at Space Intelligence as well, a, a guided storytelling platform for Red Plus projects, ARR projects, um, improved forest management projects like the Green Gold Forestry Project in Peru that takes everybody on a guided journey through the development uh, and impact of that project. So looking at things like historical deforestation, historical land cover change, the background of the project, including those co-benefits. So looking at things like biodiversity, community engagement, which uh, UN SDGs are being impacted or are improved by the project, 
But then also looking at the project baseline, really digging down in to make sure that the project is following the, the methodology standard uh, that they're meant to be following, that they have followed the 10 year rule, for example, that there's been no deforestation prior to project start, as well as looking at risk uh, and, and impact of risk. So has there actually been a uh, risk of deforestation calculated correctly for that project uh, prior to project start? What has the impact of the project actually been? So has it prevented deforestation? Has it improved biodiversity over the length that the project has been running? And that's all information that at the moment uh, is kind of difficult to find. You have to dig into the project development documents. You have to look at confusing registries. So to have all of that available uh, in one location really is, is a role that DMRV can easily provide, uh, particularly using satellite data to showcase changes uh, and integrity across project sites. Thank you, Alexis. So there is, you know, and there are a lot of questions that we will try to get at least a couple about, you know, what are the real opportunities also for measuring biodiversity. But before we go to the questions, couple, you know, we talk about the market and effectively, you know, <laughs> the pricing of these credits is key, especially in projects in, you know, where the revenues are also part of the contribution to to actually local communities. And there are actually quite good, you know, a number of questions about how these revenues are distributed. So the price of these credits is crucial, right? So do you feel like, and I'm going to ask first, Josh, um, because often you deal directly with the, with the customer. What do you, I mean, does, is, does the do you agree that this on um, the statement that the price the price of NCS credits does not always reflect the actual cost and efforts that have been invested and and then what can be done in terms of you know what is what are possible solutions and where do you see you know is is it just about the standards or going beyond the standards is it about communication I will ask the same question to everybody just to get a feeling for different experiences on this but let's start with you Josh and especially if you agree or disagree with my statement well I mean I, I guess I'd start by just like there's a premise there about the relationship between pricing and implementation costs. And I think the first thing to recognize is we are in a market mechanism. And in, you know, in markets, you, you set prices based on value delivered, not on cost to produce. And, you know, you certainly hope and aim to deliver value that far exceeds the cost. That's the whole idea of, of the market economy. And so, I'm not sure whether or not the statement is true. I think that, you know, a couple of developers here will have more insight into that. But what I can say very certainly is that the price of NCS credits, the zone that we've been in and are in now, is not even in the ballpark of the economic value that effectively conserved nature provides to humanity. And you just need to do a quick tour through the literature on the social cost of carbon to start looking at that mismatch to, to realize that NCS credits are woefully underpriced in relation to their value delivered to humanity. I do recognize, on the other hand, that we are in a market economy. The question is the value for the buyers is what really matters here, not necessarily the value for, for humanity. And I have to acknowledge, as we all should, that buyers in the system are coming in not because they have an obligation, but because they're choosing to do this. And so ultimately, the value equation it has to be delivered for the companies anyway, who are taking on a cost center on a purely voluntary basis. At any rate, the real impact of pricing in relationship to the achievement of the goals on the ground is really in relation to um, the pricing. And, and I think specifically, the pricing and how it translates into value delivery for communities and governments with a given credit price. So in seeing that, there's a credit price and then there's a model of how you allocate benefits and work with communities. So how do those credit prices and how they translate onto the ground, how does that value delivery compare with the value delivery of alternatives? Gareth is a great example of that. Why? Because he was his organization is a logging company, and somehow they decided that there's a better value equation for us all in, right, from doing this rather than doing that. And, and 
that's key is not just value as a snapshot today, but also the reliability of the value delivery over what period of time into the future, again, in comparison to the alternative. So to me, the bottom line is that, well, if you have low prices that don't reflect the value of the alternatives from a skid in a skittish market that is not really willing necessarily to commit or stand behind commitments for genuine long term offtake, that is a recipe. The impact of that is really clear. It's a recipe for ongoing nature destruction. That's yeah. clear. Yeah, thank you. Yes, that's unfortunate, very sad. And uh, we can see that, you know, how that could work out in terms of the economics. Joe, do you have, you know, what is your experience on the ground? And, and also then adding, you know, there was a question about how are you dealing with the fact that, you know, prices are going down and you still have to, you know, the commitment to the communities to reward them, to share revenues that maybe the revenues are not coming at the same level that you expected. Um, but the whole premise is that they have to receive something in order to displace the other more destructive use. So how are you managing? I mean, the real what is happening on the ground? What is happening in your projects? You're still on mute. Uh, yes, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, um, thanks, um, I mean, I can largely um, mirror, echo, of course, what Josh says. I mean, the, the reality is that it's underpriced. Um, in general, um, and it has been pretty much since we started, which is now nearly 15 years ago. Um, however, we, we did take a, um, a position from the very beginning that we would not uh, accept a price that was lower than we deemed to be necessary to build the political economic will of the communities with whom we were working to protect the resources in question. That was our absolute basic assumption, that we weren't going to allow the market to tell us how much it costs to conserve a forest or the communities who are actually doing the work. We would tell the market how much it would cost. Now, that could have meant that we would never have sold a credit, of course, <laughs> um, which means that the project would not have gone ahead. Um, but by doing that, I think we kind of baked in a, a, a a, a commitment to making conservation um, or, or to clarifying the cost of conservation. And so, you know, we, we, we've never struggled to actually get the, the, the prices that we've needed. Um, and we're in a fortunate position where having started being in a reasonably early entrance that we, we have secured some longer term deals. But there is no doubt that we would not be able to compensate the people uh, with whom we as we work and who, as I say, are actually doing the work of conservation, the communities who we work with. And remember, it goes beyond capital in many layers of uh, government, in, especially in developing countries. Um, everybody needs to feel that the, that the commitment to protect these large areas of important biodiversity is worthwhile for all levels of government. So you know, not only is there a local cost, but there's a oft, often a, a cost that goes beyond the locality. And the reality is that these decisions and, and, uh, are expensive. Uh, they, they're costly, let's say, for people, whether it's costly in terms of hitting their pockets because they can't do an alternative land use or costly because they're going out on a limb and bearing political pain in their communities or their jurisdictions. So all these things have to be considered in that price that we're talking about, that it costs to conserve areas. Um, and the reality is this is only going to get more expensive. It's only going to get more expensive to conserve nature because the pressures yes. are becoming greater. Um, yeah. So, yes, um, we are fortunate. We haven't had to accept lower prices yet, but it would be potentially impossible to convince the communities and the political um, systems in which we're working if the prices went below a certain threshold. And the market needs to know that. Absolutely. Yeah, no, thank you, Joe. And I think, Josh, you were mentioning the social cost of carbon, but here we're talking about the social cost of carbon and social cost of nature <laughs> stacking on each other. So we are really talking about really the, so, you know, all these externalities that we should, you know, and how they 
pile up on each other, you know, in these projects and they have to be, you know, compensated. Garrett, you want to add anything about from your perspective? I, I'm not sure. Have you already issued the credits and sold anything yet? Uh, we're just just about there. We're lining up our first uh, uh, customers and um, it's been an interesting process. Um, and, and I think going back to your statement, I would have to broadly say, yes, I agree with, with the statement. Um, the price is, is something that is going to affect dramatically our ability to um, develop the project in the way we want to. Uh, I think it's, it's a bit like uh, a vicious circle in the sense that um, the communication that uh, Alexis talked about is hugely important so that clients, potential clients, can make a, uh, a, a correct evaluation on, on to them what is the value of a given credit. Uh, and I think there's still a lot of confusion out there. You know, a credit is a credit or, or how much... Do, how do we differentiate uh, um, uh, the, the value of a, of a good credit from a less good credit? But clearly, for us as a business, we have um, we have fixed costs uh, which we have to cover, and then probably one of our first um, um, variable cost is is what we can put back into the communities. Uh, so we can do less or we can do more depending on the price of the of the of the credits. We we live. We have to bear in mind that we're living off that uh, income. So we have to adjust our our budgets accordingly. And we, you know, if we could get three times or four times as much uh, for our credits, we think we would be able to do absolutely amazing things uh, with the communities and with the biodiversity. But we're doing only fantastic things, but we're doing our best and we have to, we have to adjust accordingly. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think this conversation, again, is linked to the, to the going above and beyond because it's not just about delivering absolutely. the carbon, but there are so many additional activity. And I think what you're saying is that you have to do the minimum to generate these, you know, the carbon credits by and the underpinned by biodiversity and people, but there is there are different layers that you could go beyond, right? You know, you could add more activities and add more benefits depending on the price. Um, but notwithstanding, as as Josh said, this is a voluntary car this is a voluntary market right now, which is possibly one of the challenges. And we have to recognize that the companies that are buying today are buying really purely voluntarily. Because because we're not talking about the compliance market. Um, so just wanted to ask now how, you know, if we, um, from your perspective, Alexis, well, the, on one side, you come in, not you, uh, but you're the, this, the technology comes in as a cost, right? Mm -hmm. But also the benefit. So where do you, you know, up to which level you see the opportunity, you know, being a actual a, a value adding uh, activity rather than only, you know, than a massive cost center. So how do you advise your the projects to say what's the right level, right? So because then you provide that possibility of telling more stories or giving more data. So possibly also to demonstrating that what is done ha is has that value rather than becoming a, an important cost in the in the in the sheet in the balance sheet yeah, exactly. So it, it kind of depends on who we're speaking to. If we're working with a product developer themselves, we do feed into that storytelling process. So allowing them to showcase their projects, which may be pre-issuance or have maybe already issued carbon credits, really showing the impact of the project on the ground, which can help them justify uh, not that it needs justification, but can help them justify a higher price, for example, for that credit. Um, if we're working with, for example, investors or corporates who are interested in investing in a pre-issuance project, for example, where we can't showcase impact yet because the project hasn't happened, uh, we can then work with them to, for example, assess um, the quality of the, the project itself in terms of what is the opportunity of carbon potential across the project site, um, and really show a, a due diligence assessment regarding compliance with methodology um, and local regulations as well. Um, but as you say, there is um, a price component in there as well, because our services do have a cost to them as well. So it's just another thing uh, that people do need to think about. Um, and really interestingly, we've been we've been speaking um, to 
financial institutions, um, corporates, project developers about who should actually be paying for that uh, more frequent monitoring services. Should it be the project developer so they can implement better storytelling or should it be the investor or the corporate themselves so they can get a better idea independent from the project developer? And it, it's a question that we can't answer yet. I think it, it's something that's up for discussion and we need to, to better figure out how we can make sure both sides of the market have access to the same quality uh, and, and level of insight, really. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so I see that we have 15 minutes left. I want to ask a quick question to all of you, and then we're going to go and pick up some of the questions from the Q&A. So very selfishly, given that I lead a group of, you know, buyers that are um, aiming at buying high quality, and we want to, uh, basically, the NCS Alliance is about expanding demand for a high integrity NCS carbon credits. How would you build the, you know, how do you strengthen the business case for companies to actually choose NCS credits, right, rather than just and just a one ton of carbon? Joe, over to you first. Yes, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's definitely something that preys on our minds. I mean, the, the simple answer is obviously at the utilitarian end as a company, we have to invest in a lot more marketing and a lot more storytelling. Um, and we have to get out there and, and, and tell people and, and make the case that by investing in nature um, with carbon as the proxy at, the, at this point, um, you're going to be doing, doing more. You know, you're going to be, it's a better way of, both meeting your net zero targets and um, also dealing with some of the other more structural issues that we know are causing the decline in nature and, and, and the associated climate impacts. So, I mean, the simple answer is, as a company, you have to invest. Um, now, that's not necessarily convenient or attractive to, to many people who say, well, we're already investing and spending a lot of money on simply demonstrating that we have this carbon project and that there's some, you know, there's some verified emission reductions that are coming out of it. Uh, why should we spend this extra time and money telling the world what is blatantly obvious to us, that you should be buying nature credits instead of, um, you know, cheap wind credits from China or something? So, you know, that, that's, a, that's a question. Um, and I guess one of the bigger answers is that, you know, we have uh, the NCSA, we, uh, the, the, the Alliance for Nature and natural climate solutions. We have the SPTI, we have the VCMI and other initiatives now. And we hope that this more sort of public um, appraisal of, of, of the kinds of credits that are out there, the kinds of options that <clears throat> the corporate world have to meet their climate targets will be classified as such. And, you know, we, 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 we would hope that um, the the cream rises to the top, <laughs> um, as 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 my colleagues here, Gareth and Josh, say. We all feel we have great projects. We all feel we have high quality approaches. Yeah. Um, what yeah. we need is for market um, <clears throat> kind of consensus in the market to recognise that, and perhaps that is the role of some of the the initiatives that are, that are coming through, of course. Um, but then, yeah, as I said, I think there's still the onus on project developers to tell their stories. And, and that, that's the reality um, because, you know, it's not a matter of build it and he will come. This is we're way past that, as we all know. Um, so, yeah, I think that combination is, is where we're looking. We're looking for some support from third party initiatives. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, we have to recognize that we have to get out there and, and tell the story. Thank you, Joe. Gareth, as you were just. Um... You said you were just talking to your future, you know, your clients or just making the deals. How do you get them to actually understand your project and to choose your project that is specific, is about nature, is about, you know, restoration compared to something that is, you know, just one ton of carbon? Um, well, no. it's. I think we're we're finding a lot of questions coming with regards to the, the the community impacts and what are we doing with the local people and how is it benefiting them more yeah. so but not I mean there's clearly interest in the biodiversity as well but uh, specifically I would say that there's been more emphasis on the community so we're putting a lot of effort into that 
Um, and as as Joe says, it's uh, there's only so much we can do. We put our stand out there. People can see our product. They can visit us. They can, you know, we're out there telling our story. But I, I do think it's really important, uh, as Joe mentions, that the institutions out there help to to, to provide more clarity on, on the different quality levels of projects. Um, and I think there's a, a possible risk, I, I'm, I don't know, but a, a possible risk that if you have too many of these institutions, that also confuses the market. It would be really nice if uh, if it was a very clear route for somebody to say, oh, I want this product. Where do I find that product? Oh, there it is. It's that level of quality. I can find it. I can go and buy it. That's clearly some, some way off. Um, but we will keep working away at just telling anybody who's prepared to listen what we're doing and hopefully that message gets out um, and, and we can speak to as many people as possible and most importantly as well is getting people to come and see what we're doing uh, that has a huge effect thank you garrett i see a lot of hearts and claps coming through the screen so that's great um josh very quickly on this exactly on this point about how can we strengthen the business case for ncs but i would say our I don't know how to put it because it's not about which one is best, but we know, you know, a big kind of a um, challenge right now is about Red Plus, right? And is taking a huge hit. Now, cons from a conservation perspective, you know, protection is really the first stage is like the avoidance, right? For avoid having a problem <laughs> is the most effective way. How can we, I mean, and you have literally one minute to answer. How can we, what, you know, do we see an opportunity really of working together in coming with a, a you know, re, you know, putting back Red Plus on the on the agenda and making sure that it's, it's there and people understand the importance of protecting forest? We don't have a choice, first of all. Like, we don't have a choice. So, I mean, it, it's like do or die, and I mean that literally. So th this is like serious stuff and so okay we all have to keep telling our stories and actually we've been doing this lots of us have been doing this for a long time the business case is is about the impact companies really understanding and knowing they're doing something meaningful in light of eternity that's it that's why they buy red plus carbon credits a hundred percent they want to make a truly meaningful contribution to an urgent problem but what's been working so far and bespoke approaches from the better developers, it isn't going to work anymore because buyers are exposed systematically by association to anything that's tagged with Red Plus. And it's the absence of the consistency in these quality levels of the really good projects and the absence of required transparency across the board around the key elements of performance that are making buyers so exposed. So the choice to buy, you know, Joe's project or Gareth's project as opposed to something else, it's it's really a hard thing. It's a hard lift. And so I really think that what we're considering and talking about that are things that are quote, that are beyond standards right now need to become part of standards. And and this yeah. is way past what's being talked about at ICV SAM and so forth. I'm talking about quality standards for project design and implementation that relate back to the core success factors in making system change at field level, like the stuff that Joe talked about earlier, like what has really changed as a result of the work? That's the stuff that matters. True community agency and partnership, benefit sharing arrangements and transparency around all of those supported by real robust MEL, monitoring, evaluation and learning best practices. So, you know, this is one of the reasons why um, we, along with Wildlife Works and other partners, have begun this effort to establish a new standard called Equitable Earth, precisely because we think we need new market infrastructure that takes these invisible but crucial elements that are, quote, beyond standards and make them standardized. Because I think all of, all of the, it, this tide is low and it's sinking all the boats. We need to raise the tide for all the boats so that everyone gets up to that level. That's our view. Thank you, Josh. You have closed the meeting for me. That's that's. I don't need to do say anything else. <laughs> now, this is exactly. I think this is a really important point about you know um, 
it's good to be above and beyond standard, but at a certain point, we will need to standardize and making sure that all projects actually deliver that. Otherwise, there is always going to be this falling trust. Um, we have just a few minutes, and uh, there are a couple, uh, lots of questions here. I know Joe has been has started replying, so I will not look at those. But there are a couple of questions related to um, remote sensing. Uh, so, for example, this one is about how is remote sensing verified in field in the field. So, uh, both carbon and biodiversity are together a priority. Um, that you know, is is the satellite element sufficient? How do you work on specific projects? And because there was actually another question about how do you, how can you use these um, technologies to actually measure biodiversity and not just the, the carbon content? Alexis, yes. this is okay. obviously for you. <laughs> yeah, I'll quickly take that one. Um, so I see one of the questions um, from Liv is about how remote sensing data can use can be used to assess carbon stock uh, and what sort of field data or local calibration is required. Um, so that that's an easy one for me to answer in that remote sensing data uh, can be used to reliably assess carbon stock across the landscape. Um, it uses uh, a combination of remote sensing data, so optical data and radar data, but as well, crucially, um, as Murray mentioned earlier at the start of the call, LIDAR data, which can be from satellite or can be from um, a drone, for example, or a small aircraft that gives you crucial information about the height of the forest, which you can then use to assess biomass. Um, but that does need to be locally calibrated. If you want a very accurate estimation of your carbon volumes within a project site or a region, you have to have local field plot data to really get that local relationship between tree height and tree biomass, which we then use remote sensing data to scale across the project site. You could do maps without local calibration, but it won't give you the most accurate estimation that you need uh, for, for example, all of these carbon project standards. Uh, in terms of biodiversity, I'll cover that quickly. Um, there's a lot of discussion about using remote sensing data for assessing biodiversity. Um, it's not uh, actually possible to directly measure biodiversity using satellite data, but it can be a proxy and you can combine it with on the ground information like eDNA, bioacoustics, you can use satellite data, for example, to look at wildlife corridors and uh, habitat fragmentation so to see how that's changing through time. And, and of course, even looking at biomass or forest degradation, you can imply that if an area is um, being increasingly degraded, you're probably losing biodiversity as well. So there's a lot of, of ties between these different areas. Yes, exactly. So just to clarify, when we say biodiversity is not just about counting the number of individuals yeah. in, in a population, but it could be measured in many different ways. Um, and again, I think there's the cost benefit between not the total precision, but having a good sense of direction and therefore and also so that have, you know, the, the spending the, the and not the entire budget into monitoring. Um, so. Then there were questions related to actually I saw the question about the um, uh, how do you compensate mitigate risk when the price are falling. Uh, you have well Joe and Garrett. I, I'd like to finish with this question because actually, as you said, Garrett, a lot is about people, right? And the questions that demand is asking about people. And this, I think, it's a really important question about how do you work. You know. The, how do you, you know, ensure that the communities are are not taking themselves the, you know, the the fall for what is happening in the market? So, Garrett, first you, and then um, I'll go to Joe. Well, I should point out that uh, we our, our uh, contact with the communities is as a, as an employer. We're using we use community labour and workers to come and help us inside our concessions. So there would be less activity, less uh, activity in the field, so hence less employment. Uh, we're not in a position where we have to pay the communities a, a percentage or any of the of the carbon, the value of the carbon credit as such. So perhaps that's um, a slightly different question. But obviously, less activity means less economic activity for, for the communities. Thank you. Joe? Uh, yes, I mean it's a it's it's a massive challenge. But what we are doing is working with these communities to set up. I mean they already use community banks, um, and we're 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 always working to um, in collaboration as much as possible to 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 encourage the <clears throat> the revenues that are realised by the communities. I mean it's sixty percent 
in Tanzania that goes directly to these rep these these communities. Um, so you know, it's a lot of it, it's a big proportion, and as you say, if it disappears, that's going to change the calculus. So it really is about trying to smooth out any variations through either creating sort of um, funds uh, or sort of uh, savings accounts uh, or having community banks sort of buffer the delivery of the revenue so that we don't have huge amounts because the price is good and then a year later very little because the price crashed uh, and maybe it'll come back in two years but by then you've lost the trust so it really is about you know these carbon projects are carbon are, are asset natural asset management projects and that means Finance, that means planning, that means governance. Uh, counting trees, measuring trees, that's easy. It's all about people. <laughs> so, yeah. yes, uh, it, it's a huge yeah. amount of people management. Thank you so much, Joe. And so just to, I mean, I have zero seconds to wrap up, but I just wanted to say, I hope the, you know, the audience has really appreciated uh, the complexity of these projects, but the, you know, the profound com impacts that these projects can have. The fact that, you know, the project developers are just doing, as you said, Joe, so many different things are there to do the project, you know, the conservation element, the social development element. You are actually financiers and you also know the finance. So the you're working on the governance element and the implementation. So it's a really a massive amount of, you know, complexity. And as Josh said, you know, the business case is really about the impact, right? And this is what we have to tell more stories to potential buyers saying you're buying something that has a huge impact it is the the one ton of carbon is your is your trading mechanisms but these projects are about nature lift and people development so thank you so much i hope we convince some of you if you are in the buyer space to actually be more interested in natural climate solutions i work for the also the natural climate solution alliance if you're interested we have a group of buyers that can you know share more information um and you can find me for sure on LinkedIn. But thank you so much, Alexis, Josh, Joe, and Garrett. And I hope to see you all very soon. Also, thank you very much for CE Media for hosting us. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.